كيف الله؟ إن شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله نحمدك ونصلي ونسلم على رسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Brothers and sisters, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to another episode in our series, Giants of the 20th Century, Muslim Giants. And before I begin, I would like to pour my heart in grief over the sad situation in Gaza, where they have been subjected to bombardment and they are facing genocide. It behoves us as Muslims to open our hearts in prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help them to defeat the oppression and free themselves from persecution so that they can live with dignity and honor. Do that in your sujood, in all of your prayers as much as possible. And let's also extend whatever way a support that we can afford to uh, morally, financially and otherwise and also to work hard to dispel, to defeat the propaganda against Muslims and the Palestinians that is waged in the media. Now coming back to my topic today, today we are dealing with a very important personality again is one of those who worked against facing heavy odds to revive and reform the Muslim Ummah. And in this attempt, he has read the sources somewhat differently from those done by the readings done by Nursi. And of course, to some extent with from uh, from Hassan al-Banna, Rahmanullah. But inshallah, I will go into those little de details as much as possible, as it is possible in this short session. Uh, origins, education and milieu, career as a journalist, his vision of an Islamic state, and his role, uh, ro role in the constitution of Pakistan and the tests and trials, testimonials from great scholars and others about his contribution and criticism. We have to also pay attention to those who criticize some of his ideas. Finally, we will bring out some of the wisdom. Of course, this short session cannot do justice to all of this, but I will try my best to do as much as possible, inshallah. Maududi was one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. Of course, before going into our details, let us mention, you know, in brief, he was considered a Muslim philosopher, a jurist who dealt with the issues of fiqh, a historian who went into detail to study the historical facts in the Quran and also he visited all of those, you know, sites and cities that mentioned in the Quran. Uh, he also studied the seerah of the Prophet and left a, a good book work in two volumes on the seerah of the Prophet. He was a journalist activist who worked hard and struggled to revive Islam and he was a scholar. Wilford Canwell Smith called him as the most systematic thinker of modern Islam. So of course this is a, a great testimony from a historian, a sociologist who looked at the modern history of Islam and Islamic developments in the Muslim world. And this is his conclusion. He is not a Muslim, but he is a sympathetic a critic 
uh, was historian. So that's a, a very profound appreciation of his role in the Islamic thinking in the modern world. He is an exponent of an Islamic political theory. He expounded a political theory based on Islam, based on his readings of the Quran. And he did so in response to the prevailing secular nationalistic models based on his novel reading of the Quran, because he saw that Islamic world and Muslims are being threatened by this intellectual, not only politically we are threatened, but also we are threatened uh, in our ideas, in our beliefs and theology, just like the same way, somewhat different from the way that Saeed Nursi looked at it. Because the milieu of Saeed Nursi is different from that of uh, uh, Saeed Maududi. He is the author of over 170 books, including his encyclopedic Quranic commentary entitled Tafim al Quran. And in these works, as well as thousands of articles and lectures, he dealt with a wide range of disciplines such as tafsir, exegesis of the Quran, hadith, law, philosophy, history, and contemporary issues facing the Muslim world. And he articulated a novel but contentious path for the revival of Islam in the modern world. So his method is different from that of Nursi. Perhaps one of the main reasons is Nursi is operating in a different milieu than what uh, the, the milieu of Sayyid Maududi. He was in a British period, that phase of the British Empire and then also went through the struggle against the British. And then of course, aftermath of the freedom from British occupation and the development in India, of course, resulting in the partition of India and others. His method was applauded by some while drew sharp criticism from others. He's also the founder of Jamaat Islami, one of the greatest, largest Islamic movements active in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and also has influenced deeply all of the Islamic movements all over the world, in Malaysia, in even in Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries, Muslims have been influenced by his works. His works have been translated into many languages, influencing generations of Muslims worldwide. Thanks to these efforts that he made, they have conferred on him the titles, various titles, Mujaddid, of course, the idea of Tajidid we mentioned before, Allama, scholar par excellence, Imam, Sheikhul Islam, and others. This is his sympathizers and those who appreciate him. And he was also the first recipient of the prestigious King Faisal Award for his outstanding service to the cause of Islam in 1976. Now, going back to his origins, of course, he is called Sayyid. This means that his lineage can be traced back to the Prophet And Abu al al-Mawdudi, also called Maulana Mawdudi. He was born in September 1903 in Hyderabad, Rekan, pre-partition India. He was the third and the youngest of the three sons of Sayyid Ahmad Hassan, a lawyer by profession, but later towards the end of his life, he left the practice because he thought the income that he's earning through his profession is tainted with haram. So he was a man with scrupulous pieties. And so he left that practice to dedicate himself entirely solely to spiritual pursuits. Of course, he comes from a long line of deeply spiritual ancestors. He traces his lineage to the Chishti Sufi order through Khwaja Sayyid Qutubuddin Maudu Chishti. This was a great murshid of the Chishti order 
and that is where his appellations Maududi comes. He's called Maududi, you know, that traces him to Maudud Chishti. Maududi received religious, his early education and nurture from his fathers, as well as from private tutors and the line. Uh, during that period, he received instructions in the Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, Sira, Arabic, and Persian. He also studied books of Mandik and philosophy. He was a very highly sharp, he had a precocious mind, so much so that he was able to translate, you know, Qasima means Al Mar Al Jadida, the new woman from Arabic, which is a modernist and feminist work. He translated it into Urdu at the age of 11. Imagine how sharp his mind was, how intelligent he was. And he also, at the same age, he memorized the Muwatta of Malik, Imam Malik, in its entirety. And his father imparted very, he was a disciplinarian, very strict about imparting moral training to his children. Maududi recalled that once in a fit of anger, he bet, he struck a servant's son in his household. And on hearing that his father called the boy and asked him to strike him exactly the same way he had struck and struck him so insisted that the boy retaliate this was the first lesson Modudu learned about morality and and, and fairness and justice Modudu fast-tracked his studies completing his matriculation with the high distinction at the age of 14. He also at this age, he started, you know, translation on some 3,500 pages from Asfar, the major work of the 17th century Persian Shia mystical thinker, Mullah Sadra. He thought would influence Maududi because Sadra's notions of rejuvenation of the temporal order and the necessity of the reign of Islamic law Sharia for the spiritual ascension of man it would find an echo in Maududi's father. Since his father left no property, because father died, you know, because of a severe, uh, suddenly he was paralyzed and he, he died. And Maududi, he did not leave behind any wealth or property or inheritance. So Maududi was forced like his brother, to abandon the systematic education and he was left to earn a livelihood to support himself. In 1990, it was still a modern history mindset. He moved to Delhi and read books by his distant relative, the reform modernist Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the founder of the Aligarh Muslim University. And he's considered the founder of Islamic modernism in India, Maududi continued his studies still in Madras of Awkhaniya after matriculation founded by Allama Shibli Lumani, a modernist Islamic scholar who tried to synthesize traditional Islamic scholarship with modern knowledge. Of course, he moved to a more traditional Darul Ulum in Hyderabad. Of course, he matriculated from Fokaniya, you know, we should realize, we should reverse this. And then from there, after he had matriculated, he moved to Darul, traditional, he tried to study the traditional Alim methodology, pursue that kind of training, Darul Ulum in Hyderabad. But his father had moved to Bobal where he suffered a severe paralysis and died. So because of that, his studies came to an abrupt end. Disrupted by the illness of his father and eventual death, but it would not deter Maududi from continuing his studies. 
though this had to be outside the regular educational institutions. He did pursue his studies on and off through various private uh, scholars attending under the feet of private scholars and also his own reading. By the early 1920s, Abu Lala had enough new, enough Arabic, Persian and English beside his mother tongue to study his subjects of interest independently. Although most of what he learned was self-acquired, he received systematic instruction and guidance from some competent scholars. Finally, he was able to complete the Nizamiya curriculum because Nizamiya curriculum is the traditional Alim curriculum that has been followed throughout the Indian subcontinent for generations. So he did complete that curriculum and received Ijasa, although Modudi would not consider himself as belonging to the class of the ulama. Uh, he considered himself, you know, because he had very, very independent views of that Islamic curriculum, just as Nursi had criticism about the, uh, the traditional curriculum followed, the same way Maududi, because he was exposed to the modern social sciences and others, he was critical of the traditional curriculum followed in the seminaries. So early in his teens, he became a gifted writer because you know he was forced to seek a livelihood and because he had already developed through his efforts, attempts to translate various works, he, he gained a, his own style of writing, his own method of arguing, presenting his arguments and thesis. He became a gifted writer and his writings captivated readers because he was, you know, Muhammad Iqbal observed, this young man writes with the blood in his hand because it's not just imagination or reason, but also he pour forth his whole heart into it. So it comes from, it's as if he's writing with the blood. Okay, so as we mentioned, because he started, Right, uh, approach uh, writing as a career. At the age of 17, he was appointed editor of Taj, uh, an important journal published in Jabalpur at the age of 17. However, in 1920, he left the job and moved to Delhi, where his writing had attracted the attention of eminent scholars. You know, great scholars, Delhi was the center intellectual center, nerve center of the Muslim Ummah, cultural center. Whatever was going on in Delhi would have deep reaction and impact on all other states all over the Muslim India. So he, his writing attracted the attention of eminent scholars. So they invited him to be the editor of the journals uh, first, uh, the journal called the Muslim. This was also the organ of Jamiyatul Ulama, the Association of Muslim Eminent Scholars. Just like the higher, you know, Assembly of Muslim Scholars in Al Azhar and Saudi Arabia was the the main, the chief scholars. This is a big association, very very reputable. Uh, you know, Association of Scholars in India. So first their journal called Muslim and later their greater journal Al Jamia, Al Jamia. You know, this was the organ of Jamiyatul Ulama Hind. Under his, he became the editor. So it shows how they estimated him, how they valued him as a writer and as an intellectual. So under his, he continued as an editor of for seven years. Under his leadership, this journal became the leading newspaper of Muslims of India. 
Of course, because Delhi was the intellectual center of Muslim India, Maududi's mind was exposed to the wider world of Islamic scholarship, as well as the philosophical and ideological ideas, because it was a battling ground of ideas, exchanges, debates, and discussions. So he immersed himself in his studies and expanded his intellectual horizons. Horizons. He advanced his studies in Arabic language and poured over the references, works of tafsir, hadith, and fiqh at the hands of scholars. He also learned English quickly and poured over the works of philosophy, history, and social sciences. Thanks to his very extensive reading, intensive and extensive reading, he became aware of the vast gulf dividing the East and the West and the challenges Muslims are facing in contemporary times. His moving in the circles of callers and political leaders also exposed him to the intricacies of politics and the political machinations. Of course, politics has its own games. So still a modernist at heart, some critical developments in India and abroad profoundly affected Maududi's thinking. The first of this critical moment was that turned Maududi into a zealous Muslim as he the come it was the comments of Mahatma Gandhi that Islam was spread by sword because of acts of, you know, violent extremist acts of some Muslim individuals who attacked a Hindu, uh, as they say. So this forced Gandhi to make that remark, but that really aggrieved Muslim scholars Muhammad Ali, one of the great pioneer Muslim fight, freedom fighters against the British Empire, when he heard that statement of Gandhi, he wished that someone could write a book refuting these false ideas about Islam. Maududi took up the challenge and he spent months researching both Islamic and Western sources and wrote his first most important work, Al-Jihad of Islam, the concept of Jihad in Islam. It was serialized as articles in the Jamia journal, but then it was published as a book, 500 pages by Sayyid Suleiman Nadavi, one of the greatest, most outstanding scholars of India, because it impressed them. Maududi was only 25. It shows how uh, great a genius he was, and a great writer he was, a great intellectual he was, and radical in his thinking. When he was, that was his first important work. And about that experience he went through, doing his research and studies and observations, he said about it, it turned him from a modernist into a Muslim convinced of Islam's truth and its relevance for the modern world. This book impressed Muslim intellectuals and scholars so much so that Muhammad Iqbal considered it as an essential reading for everyone. Another factor that shaped Maududi was the critical event of the abolition of Khalifa Khilafa in 1924 by Kamal Ataturk in Turkey. He had participated, you know, in the wake of this abolition, Muslims agitated against it. That was 
it resulted in the so-called Khilafat movement in support of Khilafah, triggered by the Apocalypse movement. Maududi also participated in the in the Khilafat movement actively. <coughs> However, <coughs> he was critical of the leaders of the movement. Some of the leaders proposed that Muslims should immigrate to Afghanistan. This was, according to Maududi, a fiasco. This was a failure. And he was highly critical. He and his brother were highly critical of this kind of so this was another factor for him, led to him to rethink the whole project. Number three, the increasing exposure of Indian Muslims to persecution at the hands of Hindus and their efforts to turn India into a Hindu state in the aftermath of independence from Britain. So he feared that Hindus are going to dominate and they were trying to dominate and subjugate Muslims and reduce them. Of course, this is what is now going on in India. There were two paths envisioned in face of this. You know, Muslim intellectuals and scholars thought through and they developed two solutions. And there were two paths were proposed how to deal with the Muslim critical situation of Muslims uh, in India. One method was, of course, some of the great Tayyubandi scholars were part of it. We will visit uh, at least one of them, inshallah, later in the, in the series, inshallah. The path of composite nationalism, Mutahida Qawmiya, this is proposed by Jamiatul Ulama. So he will break off from Jamiatul Ulama and, and leave that editorship and he will be okay that was because he convinced that this is not the solution for muslims secondly the idea of an independent muslim state the idea was put forward they say it was the vision of muhammad iqbal of course he would die before he could realize materialize this dream maududi however envisioned the creation of an ideal islamic state based on the concept of divine sovereignty, al-hukum al-ilahiyya, or hukumat ilahi as they phrase it in Urdu. Because he thought Islam is opposed to nationalism, because Islam, Muslims do not represent a nation, because Muslims ought to act as a party of Allah, Hezbollah, and act as God's agents on earth, Okay, so the Islamic state should transcend nationalism. Every Muslim should be considered a citizen of the Islamic state because there is no race, no ethnicity in Islam. So it breaks the barriers. He considered more, but of course, to move towards this vision, moral training and self purification. These are the prerequisites for establishing a true Islamic state. And he thought that his critical analysis of the ideologies, the political discourse of the nationalists and the freedom fighters led him to a third alternative. So creation of a Muslim state would not be the right method of reform because un-Islamic politicians could not create an Islamic state. Who is going to create that kind of a state, ideal state, transcending nationalism? They cannot do that because they are ill-equipped. They have no training. They have more. They are same. Their ideas are a mixture of confused uh, reading of the Quran and with the secular and influence of the secular Western ideas. So you cannot expect that they would be capable of establishing uh, a genuine Islamic state. So what is the solution? He thought it was to form a new party or movement and prepare the believers to work towards the creation of an ideal Islamic state. This is how he envisaged. This is the third alternative 
that he was the only valid alternative according to Maududi. With this aim in mind, he founded Jamaat Islami in 1941 and he was elected its Amir. To formulate his ideas, he reread the Quran to lay the intellectual foundations for a new Islamic ideology based on the sovereignty of God, al hukum al ilahiyah as opposed to the rival secular man-made ideologies of communism, capitalism, and so-called Western democratic model. The reconstruction of an ideal society would recreate the original Madinian Muslim community. He thought that we should set up the same ideal model, the prophetic model that he implemented the established in Medina. That required Muslims to embody the ideals of the Quran and the Sunnah, like the first generation of Muslims, transcending the barriers of ethnicity, race, and language. So this is his uh, conclusion. This is after 1947, however, you know, partition of India, India would be divided. Muslims would be divided also. One group following the solution proposed by the, 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 the solution of Mutahida Qawmiya, uh, composite nationalism, they would be supporting Congress, Indian National Congress, scholars, many prominent scholars of the Uband. On the other hand, there were some other scholars who supported the Iqbal's vision of creating a, a, a nation, a Muslim nation, Pakistan. Uh, so eventually, India will be partitioned into India and Pakistan. And so when that happened, Maududi would move to Pakistan. And a large number of his supporters and followers move with him. Of course, another segment remain in India and work towards the establishment of Islam in India. Of course, the same way in Bangladesh, they have the same another branch working for establishing Islam there. So the same, there is another branch in Sri Lanka as well. Okay, so after partition, he moved to Pakistan, where he worked to materialize his vision of an ideal Islamic community. You know, earlier on, before Iqbal had died, Iqbal had saw the great potential of Maududi for reconstructing Pakistan and new society. He great great potential of Maududi, so invited him to Pakistan actually, but to Punjab. But before Maududi and also he Maududi moved there, but before Maududi could work on the project that they both envisioned, Dr. Iqbal died. And when Iqbal died, Modudi cried and said, this is, I lost the greatest pillar of support that I had in this life. So he thought that he saw eye to eye with Modudi. They were, uh, they shared the same vision for the revival of Islam and Muslims, uh, things like that. But of course, uh, a detailed study of Iqbal would reveal there is some uh, differences between the two approach, two personalities, uh, definitely. However, it amounted to shift uh, partition of India and the experiences he went through. Now further, a, a scholar changes his attitude, his, his you know, because nobody is stagnant. So amount to shift in his thinking as he seemed to accept the idea of a national state now. He had no other heart and he opposed he had opposed it the whole idea. But now he accepts it because he says this year is an opportunity for him in Pakistan to materialize his vision and to work towards a 
uh, to making a, an ideal Islamic state. And the first step towards that is to make a truly Islamic constitution. Modudi worked on this, researched and he put forward original ideas which were partly incorporated into the constitution of the Islamic Republic of India. This was a great contribution of Modudi. He, he was able to mobilize the scholars behind this. So even though they did not agree with him CI to I on his vision of an Islamic state, in this project, he could galvanize, mobilize them. So it bore fruit. His constitutional ideas were elaborated in his work, Islamic Law and Constitution. He dedicated his life to implementing his mission, mission with outstanding tenacity and determination from his early years. This was a man with the iron will. Nobody can doubt that he was once, he was convinced of, of his fate, he is ready to sacrifice everything to materialize his vision. In 1932, translate he started. So we are going back a little bit how he began. The publication of his entering journal, Tarjuman al Quran from Hyderabad. This was the starting of a new phase from a modernist to an Islamic visionary to an idea. A uh, thinker envisioning a political future for Islam. The slogan of this, this Tarjuman al Quran is still being published even after his death. His enduring legacy. The slogan is, O oh, Muslims, carry the mission of the Quran aloft and arise. Lift yourself up to hoist the flag of the Quran all over the world. So here is a true visionary telling the youth the future belongs to Islam. In this, the same vision of Nursi. Nursi said, Europe will give back to Islam. Because this material man-made ideologies are going to fail and the humanity will face a crisis only Islam can avert that crisis. So Muslims have to be ready to take on the responsibility to carry the mission of the Quran just like Nursi he sees the potential of the Quran. You see how all of these thinkers derive their inspiration from the Quran. This is the Ajaz, the miraculous nature. You know when the Prophet said, La tanka di ajaibu, its wonders inexhaustible. It is like an ocean. You cannot determine the depth of it. And expounded the motto, there is a need for a true Islamic movement that would dedicate solely to disseminate the Islamic message. It calls for nurturing individuals. You know, this requires that we train because this secular trained Muslim, westernized Muslim intellectuals, you cannot expect them to create an Islamic state. It is just like, you know, giving, leaving the chicken to be taken care of by foxes. So we need to nurture individuals who would single-mindedly devote themselves to submit to the will of Allah by detaching themselves from all other loyalties. He would call everything other than Allah tawagit just like tyrants like Pharaoh, because these are man-made gods. So you submit entirely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, renouncing all false gods. It calls for training individuals willing to face trials, persecution, imprisonments, 
and even ready to sacrifice their lives and properties, possessions for the worthy cause of establishing an ideal Islamic society. Of course, when somebody is visioning, has a vision like that, and moves towards implementing this vision, he is up against odds and obstacles and trials and tribulations. This is what happened. Mahdudi was would face a lot of persecution in jail, just like Nursiya had been, Shaheed Hassan al-Banna had been. So after a while, exposed him to some of the most severe trials. But Mahdudi displayed extraordinary tenacity, willpower, unshakable faith in his vision. What happened? He found it necessary because he sensed that mysterious hands are working behind to thwart and torpedo the inter project of Islamization of Pakistan, working behind as Muslims to divert Pakistan from his vision envisaged by the new conferences that were building. Madhudi considered the Ahmadis or Qadianis of Mirza Ghulam Muhammad. He considered Mirza Ghulam Muhammad as a self who is a self proclaimed prophet, Billah, as an implant planted by the British to, to divide Muslims and defeat Muslims. He wrote a critical work exposing the movement, the Qadiani movement, on organized peaceful demonstrations against them. Of course, because they were behind the leadership of Pakistan. They had assumed important positions in the governance. As his work elicited immediate response from the authorities. They used it as an opportunity to hold the discussions on the constitution and jail the leaders of protest against Qadianism because Maududi wanted to declare, just like other scholars, Qadian is as inferior as Kufar, not as Muslims. Accused of, so they accused Maududi and of fomenting civil war or trouble and, and responsible for violence. The military court, you know, what happened, the civil rule will be cancelled now. So they established a military court, which in its deliberation ordered the execution of Maududi because they thought he is the main culprit behind this entire, you know, uh, move against the Qadiyadis. Here is a man, when this order was conveyed to him, he welcomed it with a smile with perfect composure. He didn't move. He didn't shake. No fear, no grief, no sorrow. He said, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. All praises to Allah always. And later when the officer came to present him with a military order in writing, the officer told him, we give you, they give you an opportunity to save yourself by submitting a written apology, apology, taking back, apologizing for what you have done. We give you one week. Immediate response from Maududi was, I will never apologize to anyone. Why? Life and death are based on the sole decrees of Allah. It is Allah who causes us to die and causes us to live. Life and death are his, in his hand. The decree of death does not come from any power on earth, but from heaven. So if Allah has decreed my death, no one can stop it. But if he wants me to live, Continue to no power on earth can take my life away. What a great 
resolution, what a bravery, what a boldness. He also immediately issued a writing wasiyah to his family and friends. None of you should offer an apology on my behalf. I especially had my own mother, beloved mother. My brother, my wife and children never ever to do that, to offer an apology on my behalf. But the news of Modu, the detention and execution order elicited indignation and protest in India and all over the Muslim world. Of course, the leader, Muslim leaders from all over would protest and write and pressure the political leaders of Pakistan, the rulers of Pakistan uh, to reverse the decree. So the death sentence was changed to 21 years of detention. Modu, the strong faith and tenacity endeared him to the people and strengthen their confidence in his leadership. Through his struggle, he thwarted the plots of the leaders aligned with Qadianis and toppled their leader, Zafarullah Khan, paved the way for the ratification of the constitution through the consensus of Muslim scholars and associations. It was in 1956. Modudi considers this as a heralding a new era because it spelled out clearly that sovereignty belongs to God alone and that power is a trust in the hands of the leaders so that no one can exercise it except within the bounds prescribed by the Sharia, the law of Allah. Because the ultimate sovereign law is God alone. And insofar as humans wield that sovereignty, uh, that is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one has can make laws against the laws of the Sharia, against the principles of the Sharia. Modudi worked tirelessly to materialize vision. He already mentioned that more than 170 works in thousands of articles and lectures all over the world, all over the world, because he would visit all over the Muslim world and he would lecture. He also came to New York and Toronto and I had the great honor of uh, receiving him at the Jami Mosque when I was an Imam there and I was the one who introduced him there. Uh, that was in 1974. There was, I consider this a great honor to welcome such great personalities to our mother mosque, Jama, Jami Mosque, which is considered the mother of mosques. And of course, that was during his last years, final years. Modudi also, this uh, translated into dozens of languages worldwide. He wrote a voluminous commentary on the Quran entitled Tafimul Quran. Tafimul Quran means towards understanding, towards making people understand the Quran. Because he thought Quran has remained a mystery. Muslims don't know Quran. Because Quran is being chanted, recited. You know, it is simply a ritual. But they are not exposed to the life-giving message of this divine book. So unlike the traditional tafsir books, he's trying to present the message of the Quran in a simple way that everyone, even the layman can relate to it. It's a, as an invitation to change life-giving. It, it is for him, it should be a life-giving experience. So it is published in six volumes and it is also translated to several languages. And of course, unfortunately, the whole entire translation in Arabic is not out yet. 
but eventually it will come out but it is available in english and other languages his work attempts to present the message of the quran to the common man to help them embody his lessons the prevalent attitude of muslims towards the quran he gave two examples one is somebody goes you are suffering from a sickness a ailment you go to the doctor the doctor gave you prescription and now instead of going to the pharmacy and getting that medicine and taking it you take this prescription and sit in a corner and chant it beautifully from morning till evening your condition will only become worse and worse and you will end up dying another example used is that you hire somebody to take care of your garden you have a beautiful garden and so much work has to be done to maintain this garden so you write instructions to this man that you have employed do this do this on a daily basis and he takes these instructions and sits in the corner and reads it from morning to evening in the meantime the garden is taken over by weeds and snakes and completely devastated he said this is now this man who has not done the job comes to claim his wages you think he will be getting his wage so he is asking muslims quran has come as a prescription fil qurani dawukum wa dawaukum as muhammad al qaradi qaradi one of the greatest scholars of the second generation generation of, of tabi'in actually he said fil qurani dawukum wa dawaukum in the quran is a diagnosis of the disease of the disease and also a prescription for to cure the disease so the prescription we don't apply it in order to cure ourselves we need to take that prescription so the only way for muslims to cure themselves is to understand the message of the quran and it is the call to cure ourselves and we need to do so if we want to start a renaissance if we want to have a new awakening in the muslim world we need to change our approach to the quran mohdud he resigned from his position as the amir of jamaat e islami in 1972 because of his health challenges though he continued to work on his last book he completed it this is sirat al sarbar alam the life story of the greatest leader of the world muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in two volumes he finished that before he died he died in buffalo actually that is when he was in buffalo he was there a few years he had a son there working as a physician in the hospital physician so his son called him there brought him there for treatment and while he was there he visited jami mosque so he died in buffalo following surgeries for kidney treatment his body was transported to pakistan where an enormous a huge massive throng of people including scholars and leaders from all over the world it was a massive funeral attended his funeral it was a, a tribute to the great contribution that he had made to the cause of islam in pakistan testimonials this is abul hasan ali nadavi i should have mentioned his name we are going to uh, have a session on him next week inshallah abul hasan ali nadavi was member of jamaat e islami but of course he would later resign, resign because of his differences he deferred from his approach political uh, the way he had he thought he was exaggerating the political aspect of islam i cannot think of any other personality in the modern world who has had a greater influence on the new generations of muslims intellectually and practically comparable to that of modi 
even though he's critical of Modudi thought his movement is based on deeper and stronger intellectual foundation than all other political movements. His works focus on studying the Western civilization, its philosophy of life, its values, and analyzing them scientifically. It is hard to find in the Islamic literature anything comparable. He has presented Islam and its ways of life and civilization structure, its molding of society and life, and its leadership in a sound scholarly style and contemporary language appealing to the educated generation. Through his work, he filled a vacuum found in a, for a long time in the Islamic literature. And they have contributed greatly towards restoring confidence in the minds of the youth of Islam's ability to face the challenges of the modern world. What a great testimonial it is, even though he was critical of some aspects of Modudi's thought. Sheikh Karadavi, another world famous group, he wrote a book on, uh, um, on Abul Hassan. Uh, we will mention that. Refers to Modudi as the Mujaddid or revivalist thinker with a profound intellectual ability and sharp analytical skills. An incisive critique of the Western civilization, a caller to the Islamic way of life with evidence, an author of works and treatises translated into dozens of languages. He stood in the way of as a, a way of westernizers and enemies of Sunnah and the heretical movements such as Qadianis and the dogmatic cultic movements and the blind imitators. And he is the founder of one of the most significant Islamic movements in the Indian continent. Dr. Raja Bayoumi, who wrote a book on all of the, you know, prominent Alam al-Fikr al-Islami fil Asr al the modern world, the important Muslim intellectuals and thinkers. He considered Maududi a true successor to Afghani and Muhammad Abdu. However, Maududi surpassed them all in his incisive critique of modern secular ideologies, such as Marxism and capitalism, and the Western uh, democracies uh, sought to undermine Islam and thus presenting Islam as a viable alternative. And by founding a movement, he took the reformist agenda from the ivory tower to the lives of the real lives of the people. Now, nobody is perfect, even Maududi, no one is perfect, but Modudi was indeed a systematic thinker, inspiring personality, and influential leader, no question about that. But he has been criticized, and I would also agree with some of these critics for his relatively rigid, dogmatic approach to Islam as it were a totalitarian system, because for Modudi, system, system, political system, economic system, uh, system, everything is system. So this means it's a closed, this is a, his exaggerated emphasis on politics and his attempts to read into Quran is a innovative concept of God's sovereignty. Of course, nobody can doubt God's sovereignty and lordship, but of course, to exaggerate it, to include that human being, to limit the role of uh, human being in governance, this is going too far. And of course, his political system, economic system projected Islam as it was inflexible. As Islam is an inflexible, dogmatic. His views on the role of women in society and the niqab, the banking system, etc., also based on literalistic reading of such sources. But of course, uh, this should not take away from his great contribution, actually. Of course, let us share some of the wisdom before leaving this session. Islam is not just a religion. It is a complete way of life. Now, no doubt everybody has accepted this. And this is partly due to the influence of the articulation of Modudi. 
that Islam, Nilam and Kamil, these other scholars also adopted this kind of terminologies. True Islamic leadership is based on justice, righteousness, and compassion. Of course, the purpose of education is not just to gain knowledge, but to develop character and morals. Islam teaches us to value and respect all human beings, regardless of their race, religion, and social status. Islam inherently possesses proof of its power and resilience. Thanks to this, all the new liberation movement within the Muslim community derive inspiration from the Quran and the teachings of the Sharia. Muslims, even now Muslim feminists, they are working to improve the situation of women in society by drawing from the inspiration of the Quran. People fight against oppression and get rid of dictatorship by drawing on the inspiration of the Quran. So it's a proof of its own resilience. Muslims should actively take part in social reconstruction. Because of that, how can, you know, if this is the kind of message that Quran has to deliver for us, Muslims must, they should not stay alone. They should not just uh, ghettos, make ghettos. They should be actively participating in social reconstruction and work towards betterment of society. The Islamic concept of governance is based on consultation and mutual consent. Islam promotes tolerance and coexistence among the people of different faiths. Muslims should strive to establish a just and equitable society free from oppression and injustice. Muslims should always prioritize their duties towards Allah and strive to become better human beings. Islam mandates Muslims to be honest, truthful, just and fair in their dealing with others. The essence of jihad is to strive for self-improvement and self-amelioration to spread goodness in society. This is some of the wisdom of Maududi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him for the mistakes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate his status and help him join those scholars and imams and martyrs and enjoy join the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us also to she stay clear of the mistakes and errors in judgment. We will visit some of it as we uh, visit the life, we'll cover the life, the contribution of Imam uh, Abu Hassan Ali Nadavi in the next week, inshallah. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I urge you all to pray for Gaza, Palestine, for Palestinians in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them success over their oppressors and persecutors and help them gain their dignity and honor as declared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.